Hi friends, welcome to another first look. <laughs> Today we're gonna do something I really like to do, which is sort of do a retro first look. Put yourself back December 7th, 1941. Uh, suddenly the world dropped out from our feet uh, here in the United States and we found ourselves faced with a pending world war. Much of the world was already involved in fighting uh, the Axis powers. And now it was up to us to join the fray. Uh, what we did right off the bat was we took a hard look at ourselves. And as we tried to arm up frontline troops, we realized that there was a real problem concerning the number of handguns that were available. And uh, remember, this is really kind of soon after the 18th century. And so a lot of the guys who were making leadership decisions, you know, were born well before the turn of the century then. And, so the, really the only thing we had going for us was the 1911 pistol. And indeed, you know, essentially World War I era into the 20s and 30s, you know, were 1911 guns. And there were not enough to go around. And they realized that immediately. Well, so what happened? Well, some bright candlestick somewhere said, hey, you know, we've got all those 1917s, Colts and Smith and Wessons. You know, let's dust those off and put them to good use which they did, but guess what? There still wasn't enough, not by a long shot. And that's when our friends from Smith & Wesson <laughs> came riding over the hill uh, like the posse, you know, uh, about to save the day, because they did save the day. And what they did was they took their classic uh, Smith & Wesson hand ejector model, what we would call a K-frame, you know, Model 10 kind of a style in today's language, and they sort of upgraded it and changed a few basic things and they figured out ways to manufacture it fast and cheaply and they came out with what was called the victory model at the time you know the victory model was probably one of the best names for a gun ever because it really was about that. We were literally in a fight for our life, our culture, our country, the world's culture, the world's countries and history. And the Smith & Wesson Victory model played a not insignificant role in that, I think, if you look at it from a lot of different perspectives. Now, at first glance, it's pretty humble, and it is pretty humble. It's just a four inch fixed sight, all steel 38 special. It's got these sort of, you know, very minimalist uh, wartime style grips. As a matter of fact, they called the finish a wartime finish. Early guns were blued, later on they became parkerized. They called it a wartime finish because they didn't spend the same amount of time with hand polishing and, you know, and carefully bluing these guns. This particular gun I bought from a man who carried it in World War II on a PT boat. Uh, he actually told me some of the things that he did with this gun, and I'm here to tell you, this is a real battle-proven war hero. As the war progressed, uh, as we said earlier, the finishes became a little rougher, a little plainer. Uh, this gun's parkerized. Some of them were sent back to the armory uh, after the war and were parkerized, so this gun might have been blued initially. This gun was actually carried in Vietnam by a fellow that I knew, and as he told me, was he said, let's just say that it helped to make me feel a lot safer than I would have normally felt had I not had it with me. Now, during the war, the Victory models, uh, they were uh, four-inch, five-inch versions. Uh, they made a smallish run of two-inch versions, and those were more for, like, you know, or FBI and spy chasers and undercover and that kind of stuff. But these guns found their way into the hands of frontline troops and tankers and a lot of pilots liked them because they liked the sort of lighter weight, a little handier uh, to carry than a, a full-size all-steel 1911. Um, these guns were also parachuted behind enemy lines in Europe and in Asia. And by war's end, uh, I believe there was a total of about 850,000 made. Uh, they also made quite a few and sent them to Britain, and those were chambered in uh, 38 S and W initially for their 200 grain uh, full metal jacket load. Well, speaking of that full metal jacket load, you have to remember because of the Geneva Convention, we couldn't have exposed lead ammunition. So the classic police load of 158 grain lead round nose, uh, you know, that, those weren't uh, usable. So what the military did was they came up with a 150 grain full metal case load, which was 
pretty much what the standard issue load was throughout the war. Of course, today, you know, we have the luxury of high performance, 38 special ammunition, uh, well-engineered bullets, uh, you know, pretty much 100% reliable expansion. But without having that, you basically were cutting 36 caliber holes that were just making a little tiny holes in people and things when they would penetrate things. Uh, I've heard a lot of horror stories about these up through uh, the Korean War. Uh, having trouble penetrating even you know uniforms and, and the gear that they were wearing. The gentleman who I bought the gun from who carried it on a PT boat in World War II told me that there was one incident where they were transporting prisoners and there was a problem and they ended up shooting this prisoner with a couple of guys with these 38 uh, bullets and they basically had to riddle this guy in order to get him to stop. Uh, so he said that that sort of influenced the way he felt about his revolver after that. But nonetheless, he still carried it because it was better than, and I quote, throwing rocks. You know, I think one of the best things about these old guns are the fact that they're, they're just chock full of living history. These guns, you know, you figure they're 70, 80 years old now, uh, have spent a lifetime out there at the point of the spear. And while some were carried on perimeter duty, you know, guarding factories here in the United States, a lot of them spent their time in holsters and in the hands of, of GIs of all kinds actually fighting the war for us. And as such, I'm telling you, if you have one of these, and if you listen really carefully, uh, it will talk to you. I think one of the best parts about these guns is that they're still real guns and you can actually shoot them with modern day standard velocity 38 special ammunition. I'd stay away from plus P. It's like, you know, why press your luck and let's be kind to these old guns. Uh, I like to shoot 148 grain wad cutters, a standard target wad cutter load. The recoil is very light and uh, it's really accurate just like it is with all these kind of guns. And uh, the only challenge is this sort of narrow frame portion here, which isn't covered by grips, uh, and the, the small you know, stock grips on them tend to bite you a little bit in the web of your hand. After two or three cylinder fulls, I'm kind of done for the day. You know, I thank it and doff my hat and, and put it away. Now you can put uh, target grips on one of these if you want to. So uh, standard K-frame square butt target fits will fit, or grips will fit, and uh, you can put it to work that way. I just like the way these look, and it's you know part of the story. You know, as a bit of an experiment because I thought you might be interested. I know I was when I first did it. Uh, I'm going to sacrifice a round of my original ammunition. Uh, and put it over the chronograph just to show you. They advertise it at 850 feet per second out of this gun, and, and I found that it's actually a little less than that, so uh, let's shoot one over the chronograph and I'll show you. Okay, well that actually did pretty good. That's the highest I've ever got, which is 818. They usually seem to come in around the 750 to 775 point, so uh, I'd say we should sacrifice another one and see what happens. Okay, here we go. Round two, original ammunition. Ah, that's a little more like it. 743, which like I said, seems to be what they normally are. I guess we just had an extra good one there. And keep in mind, of course, that these guns were being carried uh, here in the States. Uh, let's say as a guard duty you know, in a, a defense factory or something like that, it would easily be carrying something like this, which is a period uh, Western 38 Special center fire 158 grain lead bullet. And so I've dug one out of this box and let's chronograph it and see what happens. I, I have not done this. Okay, here we go. World War II era 158 grain round nose 38 Special lead. So let's see what happens here. 769. That's about what I expected. You know, I was about to break everything down and it dawned on me that I've got this uh, two inch model 12 just laying right here. And while it's not a victory model, it's essentially the same setup and it's got a two inch barrel. So I was really curious to know what would the same ammunition do out of the two inch barrel. And it might be like throwing rocks. I don't know. Let's find out. All right. Uh, first shot will be uh, World War II era uh, 150 full metal case. Seven forty-two. Gosh, we almost really didn't lose anything. Okay, so the next would be World War II era one fifty-eight grain round nose lead from a two-inch barrel. Let's see. 
7.30. So, I don't know, that's pretty close. Okay, we're set up at about 15 yards to shoot a few rounds. Uh, I've got it loaded with Black Hills 148 grain uh, full target wad cutters. They chrono at about 680, give or take a little bit out of these guns. And uh, But they're really mild, they're really accurate, they're a lot of fun, and they really go well with this platform. So let's shoot five rounds and see what happens. I told you they still shoot. <laughs> I just never get tired of this. And, uh, you know, polymer is just fine and uh, we need them and they're really good for what they do and stuff. But I have to tell you, when you get something that's virtually a handful of living history like this and put some, you know, sort of normal ammunition in it and just take your time and enjoy the experience, uh, I have to tell you, it's really satisfying. Well, I hope you had as much fun as I did just now. <laughs> and uh, and I do this regularly, and it's still fun every single time. See if you can round yourself up an old victory model like this. Uh, hold it up close to your ear, and you can hear the stories, because it is going to talk to you, I promise you. And uh, don't be afraid of them. They're uh, easy to repair. Uh, they're just a basic Smith & Wesson K-frame revolver. There's some differences, but a good pistol smith can always get whatever one you find up and running i promise you so hey thanks for tuning in and until the next time please remember the four firearm safety rules and take a new shooter shooting all right see you later